forward there. Good. Next one, if possible. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. So what I mean by that is that these are problems that I was hoping to solve myself. Uh, but at, at the present stage of my career, uh, I'm thinking that maybe I, I should not count on that and I should uh, concentrate on, uh, on uh, making these problems more widely known within the community. And then perhaps I can read the solution uh, from someone else. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, I will start with uh, the definition and some examples of super curves. Uh, these are a larger class of objects than the things that are called super Riemann surfaces uh, in the physics literature. Um, then I'll talk about divisors on super curves and the idea that super curves come in pairs that are dual to each other, and they should be studied in, the, in these dual pairs rather than individually. Uh, then I'll talk about the Jacobian of a super curve and the Abel map to the Jacobian. Um, there'll be a selection of open problems throughout this talk, and I'll try to summarize them at the end. Uh, I'll also try to keep things relatively non-technical in the sense that I won't put up a lot of complicated equations. I'll try to emphasize the, the, the ideas and the concepts more than the formulas. And finally, I wanna thank my longtime collaborator, Mitch Rothstein, uh, who's having some pretty serious health problems at the moment and whose birthday is coming up on March 30th, so pretty soon. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, choosing a complex exterior algebra lambda. Uh, it has a bunch of odd generators that are called beta sub i. This is the ground ring or the ground almost field that we're going to be working over. Uh, and then a smooth supercurve X is going to be a family of one one dimensional complex supermanifolds. We are working on it. Okay, that's better. Okay, good, I've got it now. Uh, all right, so uh, a super curve is going to be a family of one one dimensional complex supermanifolds uh, over spec lambda. Uh, what that means is that a super curve has a reduced space, which is an ordinary Riemann surface. And on it, there is a Z2 graded sheaf of functions that locally looks like the functions on that Riemann surface, functions of a complex variable Z, uh, tensored with functions of an odd variable theta that can have coefficients in this exterior algebra lambda. So even more explicitly than that, the even functions on an open set of a supercurve look like functions of z and theta, that is f of z plus theta phi of z, where the even part f of z has a reduced part that's an ordinary holomorphic function of z, and then it has terms that involve uh, even numbers of betas and with coefficients that are holomorphic functions. The odd function phi uh, looks like a sum of uh, odd numbers of betas multiplied together with coefficients that are holomorphic functions of z. So those are local functions on a supercurve. And those are also the transition functions according to which the supercurve is patched together globally. Um, next slide. So it doesn't work. Let me try. Yeah, it, it's not doing anything. What's happening? Okay, sorry, sorry about this. Thanks. So the first example uh, consists of split supercurves uh, using this old terminology where the body is the reduced space and the soul is the nilpotent stuff. Uh, pick a Riemann surface to be X reduced, pick a line bundle S standing for soul and define the supercurve by the transition functions given here. So f of z generically represents the transition functions for the underlying Riemann surface. And g of z are the transition functions for 
technically the inverse bundle, S inverse. Um, what I would like is that if I have a function theta phi. I'm sorry? Uh, wh wh why do you have a line bundle? Um, so I, I want to patch together the theta coordinates from one chart to another uh, so that theta transforms as, as the generators of some line bundle. Ah, I see. Okay. So you have just one theta or what? Yes. So this okay. is a one one dimensional super curve, only one theta coordinate. So theta is patched together using the transition functions technically of S inverse. Uh, and then theta phi of Z will be a function precisely when phi of Z is a section of S. Um, none of the transition functions have any of the betas in them. Uh, those do not appear anywhere in the transition functions of, of the curve. These split super curves are important because every super curve has a zeroth order approximation which is a split super curve. Um, that is, you make the split super curve by quotienting out by, well, this is a slight abuse of notation. I really mean quotienting out by the nilpotent ideal. It means setting to zero all the beta parameters, and then you get a split super curve from any super curve you might have started with. One of the big issues that will reappear all the time in this talk is which functions on the split super curve that are independent of the betas can be extended to be holomorphic functions on a general super curve. That is, they need to be augmented by some higher order terms in beta so that they become holomorphic functions on X. And the unfortunate fact is that not every function on the split super curve will extend this way in general. And that causes a lot of problems that we will see. Next slide, please. So the next important class of examples are, are elliptic super curves. I used to call them super elliptic curves until I found out that that had another meaning. And I will try to stop saying that. These are generalizations of ordinary elliptic curves. And they provide a lot of very nice e explicit examples that are easy to work out and understand. So an elliptic super curve is defined by picking an even element tau in this exterior algebra, such that the imaginary part of tau reduced is greater than zero, and picking two odd elements that I'll call epsilon and delta. And then the supercurve will be a quotient of the affine superspace C11 by some lattice uh, that looks like Z cross Z. This lattice has two explicit generators that I'll write down. One of them just shifts the even coordinate by one. The other one shifts the odd coordinate by delta and performs some shift on the even coordinate, mostly involving tau. Um, the resulting supercurve has a reduced space that is an ordinary torus with ordinary modulus tau reduced. Um, the associated split supercurve would have S being the trivial bundle um, on that torus. And if you want to or if you want to compute the functions on X, the global holomorphic functions on X, those would simply be functions of two variables Z and theta that are invariant under the lattice generators. So um, for an ordinary elliptic curve, the global functions would be constants, but you could ask what the global functions are on, on this object. Uh, next slide. Another class of examples that I won't say a lot about in detail in this talk, but they're important, are super curves for which S is a degree zero bundle, but not the trivial bundle. This is important because those line bundles have no global hol holomorphic sections. Um, those play a role in that in the theory of the super KP equations, they are the spectral curves from which you construct solutions of, of this integrable hierarchy uh, of, of supersymmetric differential equations. Uh, but I won't go into that aspect of the theory uh, here. Uh, next slide. So let's talk about the cohomology of a general supercurve. If we start with the split case and we look for global functions on a split supercurve, uh, they are of two types. Uh, the even functions essentially are just constants. They are functions on the underlying uh, Riemann surface. The odd functions are sections of this bundle S. Um, and it's important to see 
that there are non-constant global holomorphic functions. Uh, there, it's not just the constants as it would be on a Riemann surface. Uh, the functions theta s of z are, are global holomorphic functions whenever the bundle s has global sections. Um, another useful category of examples are these generic supercurves. Let's say the underlying Riemann surface has genus G. What's useful about these curves is that their cohomology groups are free modules over lambda. That doesn't always happen. Um, for a generic SKP curve, the only global holomorphic, holomorphic functions are indeed constants from lambda because S has no sections. And then H1 uh, also is a free module over lambda. It has G even and G minus one uh, uh, odd generators. Um, it's important that ser duality works on supercurves. Um, there's a duality between H1 of functions and H0 of Burr. Uh, the, the dualizing sheaf uh, or the canonical sheaf of a supercurve is actually the famous Berezinian sheaf. Um, and, and that appears everywhere as a consequence of ser duality. Uh, you can be quite explicit about what the Berezinian sheaf is in the case of a split supercurve. Um, the sections of Burr that are independent of theta look like sections of Ks inverse, where K is the canonical bundle of the underlying Riemann surface. And then the odd sections that look like theta omega of Z uh, of Burr are actually the sections of K. That is, uh, the omega of Z objects are actually the abelian differentials on the underlying Riemann surface. So if you look for the abelian differentials, in general, Burr is a generalization of those. Um, if you ask about an arbitrary supercurve, in general, it is not as nice as the generic super KP curves. In general, uh, H0 of O will be a sub-module of a free module, and generally H1 of O is a quotient of a free module. Both of these reflect the fact that not all the functions on X split extend to X. There's generally a subset of the global functions on the split curve that will extend holomorphically to X. Um, and so, X0, so H0 is only a sub-module of a free module. Um, next slide. You can be very explicit about that in the case of an elliptic supercurve and you can, can get an understanding of why this happens. So if you look for the global functions on an elliptic supercurve, you're looking for functions that are invariant under the generators of the lattice that I wrote down earlier. And it's easy to show that they have the form A plus theta alpha, where A and alpha are constants, that is elements of, of the algebra lambda, con constant elements. However, not every constant element will work because one of the generators of the lattice is a shift of theta. It shifts the theta coordinate by this uh, modulus delta. And that means theta alpha is not a globally defined function unless alpha annihilates delta. Um, so there's this restriction that alpha delta has to be zero. And in that sense, this is not a free lambda module. It doesn't have one even and one odd generator. There's a constraint on, on, on the elements. Another way to see how that works is that quite generally, you can make H0 of O free if you don't require its sections to literally be holomorphic functions. If you allow them to have nilpotent poles somewhere, let's say at Z equals zero, um, then, you can, then it becomes a free module. And um, the function on the elliptic supercurve that didn't extend in general was theta. It was a function on the split curve, but not a function on, on, the, on the curve in general. Um, however, if you allow it to have nilpotent poles, then there is a, a function uh, whose lowest order part is theta. Uh, it looks like this, where the capital theta is a theta function on, on the torus. I had to use capital theta to distinguish it from the coordinate theta. Uh, that's one of the, the standard theta functions on a torus. It's the one that has uh, a zero at z equals zero. And consequently, its logarithmic derivative has a pole at z equals zero. Uh, and under a lattice generator, it shifts by a constant. And so you can compensate for the constant shift in theta by creating this combination uh, of theta and, and the theta function. That's a global function that's holomorphic except for nilpotent poles. Uh, 
Um, and if you allow things like that, then H0 of O becomes freely generated. Uh, it's not holomorphic, of course. And if you want to make it holomorphic, you have to multiply it by alpha, um, provided alpha delta is zero. So you recover the previous set of holomorphic functions by, by annihilating the nilpotent pole, essentially. And that's another way of understanding why there is this structure uh, of a non-free module. So that's a really good example to keep in mind. Next, um, let's go on and talk about divisors on a supercurve. Um, an effective divisor in the vial sense is a submanifold of co-dimension one zero. So it's a submanifold that could be defined by an even equation uh, locally. Uh, since the supercurve has dimension one one, if you write an even equation, that will generally give you a, a, a locus whose, whose reduced part is just a point or a collection of points, but there's still an odd component to that. There's still an odd direction. So one way to think of that is that an irreducible divisor is like a point that has an odd tangent vector associated with it. It has an odd direction attached to that point on the supercurve. If the supercurve happens to be embedded in a projective space, a super projective space, you could think of that as an odd line that is contained in X. It's an odd subvariety, which, which is an odd line. A, a general divisor would be an integer linear combination of these, if, these uh, irreducible divisors. Um, if you'd rather think of divisors in the Cartier sense, then you're thinking of a local equation of a divisor like this. For example, uh, an irreducible divisor could be defined by an equation locally, z minus z zero minus theta theta zero equals zero, where z and theta are the coordinates on the supercurve, z zero and theta zero are even and odd parameters that describe the particular divisor you've chosen. Um, in that sense, a divisor looks a lot like a point. Uh, that is, it has an even parameter z zero and an odd parameter theta zero. Uh, you might think that a divisor, an irreducible divisor is simply a point or can be identified with a point, but that's not correct. It turns out that if you uh, make a change of coordinates, if you patch two charts together, for example, the parameters z0 and theta0 do not transform the same way as the coordinates z and theta do. So if you want to define the same divisor, you don't change the parameters in the same way that you change the coordinates. There's another transformation rule for those parameters that you can compute. Uh, and so they are not points in that sense. Next slide. The way to think of it is that the patching rules for the parameters of a divisor define another supercurve. Uh, they are the transition functions for a different supercurve distinct from the original one, which I will call x hat. In that sense, the dual curve is the moduli space of irreducible divisors on the original curve. And you can be very explicit about what that dual curve is in a specific example. I will call it x hat in general. Uh, in the split case, you can be very explicit. For a split supercurve, the dual curve has the exact same reduced space, same Riemann surface, but the line bundle on it is the, the Serre dual line bundle. That is S inverse tensored with the canonical bundle of the Riemann surface. So in that sense, this duality is a, is a super generalization of the standard Serre duality of line bundles. If you want to think of a super curve as being some kind of infinitesimal neighborhood uh, of a Riemann surface, this is an extension of Serre duality to that infinitesimal neighborhood. For, a, uh, for an elliptic supercurve, you can be quite explicit even in the general case. Uh, duality is the operation that interchanges the two odd modular parameters. The epsilon and the delta parameter get interchanged by, by the duality. Um, and the, uh, the even modulus, the tau parameter, gets shifted by something nilpotent, by epsilon delta. Uh, the reduced part does not change, of course. And the general philosophy is that you should not study uh, supercurves individually. You should study these two objects, x and x hat, as a pair together, uh, along with the locus defined by z minus z hat minus theta theta hat in the product space x cross x hat. You could call that the super diagonal uh, in the product space. 
And these objects need to be studied together in, under, in order to understand them completely. Uh, next slide. Okay. Let me say a little bit more about this super diagonal about, and about all these objects in general. So the super diagonal, which you might otherwise call the universal divisor, uh, is that subvariety that I'll call delta uh, defined by that equation uh, inside the product space. It is a one two dimensional supermanifold. Uh, it is technically an n equals two super Riemann surface. And it, it uh, can be thought of as a fiber bundle with the fibers being dimension zero one over both X and X hat. So it comes with projection maps down to X and X hat where you forget one of the two odd coordinates, basically. Um, it is a kalabi yao manifold in the sense that it's, its canonical bundle, its Berezinian bundle is trivial uh, as one can verify from an explicit computation. There is uh, an adjunction formula as an analog of the ordinary sort of adjunction formula in algebraic geometry. That is a formula that would tell you the normal bundle of delta in that product space. And it is, it is basically the product of the two Berezinian bundles. Um, I didn't know about this symbol of the uh, cross with a box in it until recently. What, what that means is you take the Berezinian bundle on X, you take the other Berezinian bundle on X hat, you pull them back to delta using the two projection maps and you take their tensor product there. And that gives you a line bundle on delta, which is in fact, it's normal bundle in, in that product space. Um, this construction of lifting line bundles is very interesting. You could take arbitrary line bundles on X and on its dual, and you could pull them back to delta using these projection maps. And you could take their tensor product there and obtain a line bundle on delta. And you could ask yourself, do you obtain all the line bundles on delta by this sort of construction? In other words, given an arbitrary line bundle on delta, can you factor it into bundles that have been pulled back from X and X hat in this way? And the answer is no. Um, there is an obstruction to doing that. Um, this is something that uh, I worked out with Fausto Ange many years ago. Roughly speaking, you can factor the transition functions of a line bundle locally, but there's some global problem in making them consistent across the entire uh, space. Okay. Um, next, please. Here we go. Um, the, the, the study of these spaces is made a little more complicated by the fact that there is not any kind of direct mapping from X to its dual. There are various indirect mappings. For example, there's something called picture changing in the string theory literature. And one example of it is that it is a way of identifying sections of the Berezinian on X with closed one forms on X hat. Uh, that's another one of these pullback constructions. You take a section of the Berezinian on X you pull it up to delta using the projection map, and then you push it down to X hat using essentially some kind of integration over the fiber construction. And the result is a closed one form on X hat. Um, you can be very explicit about what this looks like in local coordinates. If you have a section of the Berezinian on X that locally looks like alpha plus theta B, it corresponds to that one form that I've, I've written there explicitly underneath it. Um, on X hat. Um, this is a correspondence that was actually first discovered in the case of super Riemann surfaces, uh, but it works in general. Um, and it's very useful because it gives you a way of integrating sections of the Berezinian. Uh, you can imagine having a path uh, on X and you can imagine the endpoints of that path being divisors. Um, something like that is necessary to define the obel map, which we will do in a moment. Um, and the way to do that is to is to switch your 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 uh, switch your attention to the dual curve, where the section of the Berezinian becomes a closed one form, which you can think of d as a function. You can think of as d of a function, and you can evaluate it at the divisors at the endpoints of the path. It gives you a notion of integrating sections of the Berezinian. Um, okay, uh, thanks.
Um, let's talk about super Riemann surfaces for a moment. It would be really nice if you had a super curve that was self-dual under this duality operation, because then you would be able to identify a divisor with a point, basically, much like you do on an ordinary Riemann surface. And there are self-dual super curves. They are precisely the ones that are known as super Riemann surfaces uh, or super conformal manifolds uh, originally in the physics literature. That imposes a restriction on the transition functions, which makes them super conformal. Uh, this was not the original definition of a super Riemann surface, but I think from a, a modern point of view, this is really the nicest definition. Um, they, they are simply the super curves that are self-dual. If you're talking about a split supercurve, that imposes the condition that S has to be a square root of the canonical bundle. In other words, it has to be a spin structure. For an elliptic supercurve, it imposes the condition that epsilon equals delta. Uh, of those two odd moduli, there's only one in the case of a super Riemann surface. So here come the first of the, of the uh, open problems that I wanted to uh, advertise. Is there a generalization of this kind of duality to supercurves with more, more odd coordinates, uh, supercurves with odd dimension n? Um, the answer is that there's not a simple way to do that. In, in the original literature on duality, there were various attempts and explanations of why it couldn't be done. I, I'm not actually ready to give up. I've been talking with Mitch Rothstein about possible more complicated generalizations. We don't really have a concrete result yet but we're not ready to give up. It seems as though there should be a, a generalization of this duality to higher dimensions. The second problem that I find really interesting is suppose you've embedded your original super curve in a super projective space. Is there some kind of extrinsic geometric realization of this duality or a geometric construction uh, of the dual super curve? Um, it, it is defined as a set of odd lines in super projective space. And so it would naturally embed in a super Grassmannian of those odd lines. As we learned in an earlier talk, super Grassmannians are not generally projective. So you can't go from there to having X hat be in a super projective space. But it seems like there should be some way to do that. It seems like there should be some way to, to realize X hat in another projective space or just construct it directly in a geometric fashion much the way there is an ordinary projective duality in, in classical algebraic geometry. So I don't know how to do that, but I would like to find out how. Uh, thanks, next slide. Let's talk a little more about line bundles on supercurves. Uh, in the classification of line bundles on an ordinary Riemann surface, there is a standard uh, exponential exact sequence that plays a, a central role. Um, this is because the transition functions of a line bundle are, are even invertible holomorphic functions. So they show up in that, uh, in that sequence. And the cohomology sequence associated to this tells you that line bundles of degree zero at least are classified by something called the Picard group, pick zero of X. And that can be thought of as H1 of X with coefficients in the even uh, holomorphic functions modulo uh, H1 of XZ, a lattice, basically. If you use Serre duality, you can show that this is isomorphic to another object called the Jacobian of the supercurve. That is the, let's see, the lambda linear, the lambda linear odd functionals on H0 of Burr, on, on sections of Burr, modulo some kind of period lattice. That object is called the Jacobian. And you would hope that each of these objects is a super torus. That is, each of them should be an affine superspace quotiented by a torus, uh, much like the generalization of an elliptic supercurve. That generally does not work because the cohomology groups that appear there are not necessarily free lambda modules. And so you cannot normally identify them in any way with an affine superspace. Um, and that creates all kinds of problems in general. Um, these are not generally super manifolds. So what do you do with them? The one exception is in the case of generic super KP curves where the H0 and H1 are free and these objects are genuine super tori of some sort. Okay, next. 
So here's another set of open problems. The, the first one I think is really an important problem in supergeometry more generally, which is how, how should we work efficiently with superspaces of this type, where you take a cohomology group that is not a free module uh, and you mod out by some lattice. Uh, how do you work with it given that it's not a super manifold? Uh, there was uh, a paper by Tsuchimoto, which was far ahead of its time. Uh, that's the one I think that started to exploit this idea of allowing nilpotent poles uh, to make the cohomology groups free. And you can certainly do that. And that will give you something that is a super manifold, but it's no longer literally the moduli space of line bundles, which is what you wanted in the first place. You can think of it um, as some kind of moduli space of a bundle with some kind of framing, I suppose, but it's not so clear to me what that kind of framing is or how you should think of it. So how do you efficiently set up a method of, of doing computations or studying superspaces of this type, particularly in this setting, but, but others as well? Um, another interesting problem is that on an ordinary Riemann surface, it is the case that every line bundle of degree zero can be presented uh, with transition functions that are constants. You can arrange uh, that in every pair of chart overlaps, you can specify it by transition functions that are just constants. This depends on Hodge theory, which does not work in general in supergeometry. And so uh, as a narrow question, what do the other line bundles of degree zero look like on, on a general supercurve? Uh, as, a, as a bigger question, uh, what, what do you do uh, as a replacement for Hodge theory? But I'll, I'll bring that up a little bit later, I think. So what do all the line bundles of degree zero look like on a general supercurve? Uh, a bigger problem is what are the relationships between the Picard groups or the Jacobians of these three spaces, X, X hat and delta? There's certainly some relationships between them because as I said, you can pull back line bundles from X and X hat to delta. So that gives you some relationships. Um, all of them contain the line bundles with constant transition functions. They all have the same reduced space and you can use the same constant transition functions to define a line bundle on any one of them. But other than that, um, what, what are the relationships, if any, between the Picard groups of these spaces? The, the collection of line bundles on each of these different spaces. Okay, next. Um, the next element of this theory in the case of an ordinary Riemann surface would be the Abel map. This is the mapping that takes a divisor of degree zero and just maps it to the line bundle that it defines in the Picard group, the bundle of degree zero that would have such a divisor as the divisor of one of its sections the divisor of zeros and poles, essentially. Uh, that certainly makes sense in this setting. Um, and there is uh, a way of, of writing that as a map to the Jacobian as well. Um, it's essentially the generalization of the ordinary Abel map, if you think in terms of vial divisors, it's what I said before. So given a divisor of degree zero, what you'd like to do is you'd like to define a linear functional on sections of Burr. And the way you do it, is you, you uh, take the points of the divisor, you connect them with various paths, you integrate the section of Burr along those paths and you add up the result. That gives you a linear functional on the section of Burr specified by the divisor. Um, and then you mod out by the period lattice, which is integrating sections of Burr along closed curves, essentially, uh, the, the closed curves that generate the homology of the, of the Riemann surface. So this works in essentially the same way that it works on an ordinary Riemann surface. Uh, so, so there is an Abel map of this type. You can even go so far as to define what you would try to call a theta divisor in the Picard group. Uh, one of the definitions of a theta divisor is it's the set of line bundles uh, that have sections that have global holomorphic sections. Uh, you can do this even in the general case where you're not assuming these things are super manifolds yet. Uh, if, you, uh, if you make the cohomology free and you make these into honest supermanifolds, you can go further and you can define actual theta functions on them. I'll try to give you an example in a minute. Uh, Tsuchimoto did that in his early paper. Um, okay, next. So here's a couple of additional open problems. 
the first problem would be considered the Jacobi inversion problem in the case of, of classical algebraic geometry. That is, if you look at all the divisors that map to a given line bundle, what do they look like? And in particular, can you find a divisor of a special type uh, in each fiber? Uh, in other words, is there a divisor of a specific type that will map onto the Jacobian that can be used to define an arbitrary line bundle? So in the classical case, what you would do is you'd pick a base point uh, divisor, you'd pick a P0 as a base point, you'd pick a collection of other points, P hat J, and you'd make a divisor of degree zero as a sum uh, of individual divisors of degree zero from one to N as written there. And the classical Jacobi inversion theorem would say that you pick N equal to G, the genus of the curve. Uh, and then this is an onto map. Every, every line bundle of degree zero uh, can be defined by a divisor of that type. That's certainly not literally gonna be true on a super curve because um, there's this extra object S, the line bundle that you chose that is part of the structure of a super curve. And the type of divisor or the degree or the number of terms in the divisor is going to depend on that S. Even if S is of degree zero, I don't think it's true that you can choose N equal to the genus. So this problem is more or less open. Uh, is it true that every fiber contains a divisor of this type? And is there some bound on the value of n that you need in terms of the genus of the Riemann surface and uh, something about s, maybe the degree of s. Uh, so the Jacobi inversion problem is an open problem. Another question is, what do you do about Hodge decomposition? An example of Hodge decomposition in the ordinary setting would be uh, this equality or isomorphism between h1 of c and h0 uh, with coefficients in uh, one forms uh, and its conjugate. Um, this kind of thing cannot work on a super curve because the, the cohomology on the left is an ordinary topological cohomology of the reduced Riemann surface. It's only sensitive to what the underlying Riemann surface looks like. The cohomologies on the right are analytic cohomologies that depend on the super Riemann surface, you're uh, super curve you're talking about. And they are, are, are of this type that might not even be freely generated. So there's no way that, that an equality like that can be true in general. So is there some replacement for uh, the standard Hodge decomposition and the various consequences that follow from it in ordinary algebraic geometry? Uh, next. Uh, let's say a little more about theta functions. Um, in general, it's an open problem to give a general definition of theta functions and a theta divisor on the Jacobian? Or why, why should we stop there? Why don't we talk about general abelian super varieties? So let's talk about an arbitrary affine superspace mod out modulo lattice G. Uh, is there, are there theta functions in general on such a thing? Certainly you can construct them explicitly in the example of a Jacobian and if you assume that the cohomology is free and these things are ordinary supermanifolds and or ordinary super tori, you can construct them out of the usual theta function on the reduced space. What I mean by a theta function is I want it to be a function that is invariant under half of the generators of the lattice. And I want it to get multiplied by a factor, something like exponential of minus two pi i z under the other generators of the lattice. That's essentially what an ordinary theta function is. On an elliptic supercurve, you can give a pretty explicit definition of such a thing. You can write it as a sum very analogous to the definition of an ordinary theta function. So the super theta function on an elliptic supercurve is this object that I'm calling H because I can't call it theta, that would be too confusing. Uh, you should compare that definition with the definition of the classical theta function, which is written underneath it. Um, they're similar in some respects. In fact, they're similar enough that you could almost construct a super theta function by just modifying the definition of the classical theta function. So if you compare the terms involving n and n squared, they're quite similar. If you just formally replaced the parameter tau by tau plus theta epsilon, that would be close to defining the super theta function that you want. Um, 
the more problematic term is this n cubed delta epsilon term in the formula for H. Um, that's completely nilpotent. So you could actually factor that out of this exponential. You could factor it out in the form of one plus one third n cubed delta epsilon in front of the exponential. And so what you really need to define the super theta function is you need some way of bringing down an n cubed in front of that exponential in the sum. And you can do that by taking derivatives of the theta function with respect to either z or tau. Uh, for example, if you took a third derivative with respect to z, or you took one derivative each with respect to n, uh, z and tau, that would bring that down where you need it. So in general, the super theta functions look like shifted versions of the ordinary theta functions together with combinations of their derivatives. So you can construct such objects in a relatively explicit way. Um, okay, thank you. Um, there's another object that appears in function theory on a Riemann surface. And this is another open problem that I've been thinking about in the supercurve setting. And this object is called the prime form. Um, the natural generalization of it to this setting would be that it's a, a section of a bundle on X cross X hat. Uh, it's a section of O of delta. Is essentially, it's a function on x cross x hat that has a pole along delta, if you want to think of it that way. Um, this object is useful in ordinary uh, Riemann surface theory because it is related to the theta function. Um, there's a mapping of x cross x in, in the Riemann surface case to the Picard group or the Jacobian. And there should be a generalization of that that works in the supercurve case. Um, I don't know exactly what it is, but my speculation would be that it's this mapping here. You map X cross X hat to the Picard group of Delta in the following way. You pick a point P of X, you pick a point Q hat of X hat, then P is a divisor on X hat and Q hat is a divisor on X. So you can make a line bundle O of minus Q hat and you can make a line bundle O of P. And you can pull those back to delta and take their tensor product, and you can make a line bundle of degree zero. And that should be uh, that should be this um, that should be this um, mapping that you're looking for. There is some kind of pullback of the theta function by this mapping that I have not worked out uh, that relates it to the prime form. And this should be even more useful than theta functions if you're studying function theory on a supercurve, because it should be a way of bypassing this issue about whether the Jacobian or the Picard group is really a supermanifold or not. Um, if you work with a theta function, you have to worry about that. But if you work with the prime form, you don't, because x, x hat, and delta definitely are ordinary supermanifolds, and no such problems uh, arise. So this should be something important to work out um, for function theory on a supercurve. Next, this is a problem that is a little bit orthogonal to the other ones that I've mentioned in this talk, but it has been annoying me for a long time that I don't know how to solve it. So I will, I will mention it. So if we talk about super Riemann surfaces in particular, you can construct a super Riemann surface of genus greater than one. Uh, by an analog of the classical construction. That is, you take the super upper half plane with coordinates z theta, and you mod out by a super analog of a Fuchsian group. So this would be some discrete subgroup uh, generalizing PSL 2R. Uh, it would be a subgroup of the supergroup OSP 1, 2. Uh, I've written here explicitly what a typical uh, element of that group looks like. It's a transformation of that type generalizing an ordinary fractional linear transformation. Uh, there's an object uh, called a Poincaré series, which should have a super generalization. They are used to construct uh, automorphic forms in the theory of Riemann surfaces. Uh, in the super case, what it should do is it should, the input to a super Poincaré series should be essentially any function, f of z and theta, and the output should be what's called a super conformal tensor of weight Q in the physics literature. Basically, that's just a section of the Berezinian to the Q power. 
Uh, and what, what, the way you should do this is by taking your function and summing over all of its transforms by the group elements, along with some kind of a weight factor uh, that makes the series converge and, and gives it the appropriate transformation rule under the group. And the conjecture is that a series like this will converge if Q is, is at least two, I guess. This goes way back to the early literature on, on string theory and superstring theory. And it was taken for granted in the physics literature that this would work. As far as I know, there has never been a proof that a series of this type converges. Um, and gradually it's been dropped from the physics literature. I, I, I don't know if that's because they realized there was no proof uh, or because they just lost interest. But uh, I would be extremely interested uh, to see a proof or a disproof for that matter uh, that of whether super Poincaré series converge or not. Next. Okay, so this and the next slide are just kind of a summary of some of the problems that, uh, that I have mentioned. Uh, first, I think we need a general machinery in super geometry for dealing with super spaces that are constructed from these non-free cohomology modules. Uh, one way is by allowing nilpotent poles, maybe there's a better way. Second problem is various generalizations of the duality that I've talked about, uh, either a generalization to higher dimensions or some kind of geometric formulation of it uh, in terms of a projective embedding of, of the super curve. Uh, I think we need to know more about how the line bundles on these three objects are related, uh, x, x hat, and delta. How are their Picard groups related? Uh, what are the line bundles of degree zero that do not have constant transition functions? Are there other sorts of interesting picture changing maps that relate functions or sections of different things on X and its dual? Uh, what are the fibers of the Abel map specifically? What's the solution of the Jacobi inversion problem? Uh, is there a specific type of divisor uh, for an arbitrary bundle? Um, can you say more about um, can you say more about theta functions and the theta divisor uh, analogous to the classical theory uh, with or without this assumption uh, that you're dealing with genuine super manifolds? Uh, next, um, is there uh, this object called the prime form? What what is the appropriate definition of it? What properties does it have? How is it related to the super theta functions? Can you prove or disprove uh, this conjecture that super Poincaré series converge in general? And uh, can you say more about line bundles on abelian super varieties? So this would be the beginning of the whole general theory of, of abelian varieties and generalized to the super setting. In particular, uh, one of the first steps in that theory is something called the Apple, the, the Apple Humbert theorem. This is essentially a general classification of line bundles on abelian super varieties. And um, I, I, I mentioned, I, or I, I noted what the typical transformation function, uh, what the typical transformation rule of a theta function would be that you want. Um, you can just postulate that. You can just say, I wish that a theta function would transform this way, but it would be nice to have a general theorem that says every line bundle on an abelian variety has that kind of transition function. So you're, you're, not, you're not specializing at all when you, when you ask what a theta function is. You're, you're just using the general result for what the, what the transition rule of any line bundle on an abelian variety is. Um, I don't know what the content of that super generalization of this theorem would be. Um, and that's sort of the initial step uh, in, in a geometric theory of, of, super, of, of abelian super varieties. So I hope that, um, all or some of these uh, open problems are both intelligible and interesting. Um, and I hope that uh, people will, will uh, try working on them or talk to me about them. I'd love to know more about any of them. And then I have several slides of references that I won't go through, but they're, they're here in case I need to refer to them. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.